Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, bringing you a program devoted to painting and drawing. Um, in the small time uh, available to us on a program such as this, I'm going to try and give you as much information as I can for the subject at hand, which today is a floral study with uh, working from life with flowers that I have brought in to the studio. And um, I'll, as we go along, I'll try and hit the, the points that are important to remember if you are uh, painting flowers. In the meantime, let me tell you that I have a book that I've put out called when Working from Life at the Cable Easel. Uh, I'll tell you more about it later on in the program, but it's a little book that will encapsulate all the things that I'm trying to tell you on this particular program. So, uh, without any more waiting, let me show you the uh, still life that I have brought in today. It's a perfectly ordinary bunch of flowers, a petunia, an artist's tulip in the background, and a sprig of pink dogwood in a perfectly ordinary little vase of mine, which happens to be navy blue. Uh, this is what I'm going to be working from because that's my thing. I believe in working from life. Do not copy photographs and don't copy pictures or other people's paintings work from life. Um, I, assuming that people who watch this program have some information about drawing, I, have, I can't take the time to draw it for you on, on camera. It would simply take too long to place because the interesting thing is the application of paint on this kind of thing. But I merely placed the petunia, the dogwood, the tulip in the background, and the spray at the top, and just the placement of the vase. And I'd like to just get right down to the business of, of applying paint. I've prepared the background because that is also would take far too long on a program as short as this one. So let me start with the pink dogwood. I'm mixing a color on my palette. Um, uh, and my palette consists of probably, well, let me see, probably 20 colors. Um, I'm going to be mixing the, uh, a, a color which is called quinacridine rose. It's a very complicated name for something which is merely pink. Um, the uh, mixture of white and all the other colors is, if white is the most predominantly used color on the palette. Uh, so you always uh, squeeze out a very large area of white, such as there, and all the other colors uh, sort of fan out around it. And mixing is in the center of the palette, which is known as the field. So applying paint for flowers has to be done rather quickly, as, as do all flower paintings, because of the rapidity with which they fade and vanish. And so um, a knowledge of drawing is important and a knowledge of, a, of an accurate layout before you actually begin painting. And then what comes into play is observation. Now I'm observing uh, this dogwood as being uh, whiter in the center than it is in the petals, and the petals become gradually roser and redder as they get towards the edge. I'm going to keep emphasizing the business of learning how to see. That's one of the things that my little book talks about, is learning how to see. And when you have uh, been able to cope with the business of seeing something and then understanding what you see, uh, transferring that to paint is not as difficult or as mysterious as a lot of people think it is. It is a um, it is just like all other uh, disciplines. It's a uh, question of practice and also um, many, many times logic. Now the logic here is when you're dealing with pale colors such as pink and white, it is essential that you keep your brush clean at all times. I'm now going to blend from this white to this rose and I, wash the, I wipe the brush clean so that I can blend it and have a smooth uh, gradation from pink to white. The underneath part of that, uh, of that petal is in the same pink hue, but it is darker. And because it is near me and it is in shadow, it is going to be 
uh, that should be a little have a little bit more green. You subdue pinks and mauves by the use of sap green. At least that's the way I do it. I do not use umbers. Umbers, in my opinion, dirty up pictures rather badly and give an, an unfortunate dirty tone. Um, dogwoods have a lovely characteristic. They have little ribs in their petals, and I think that if you were to find a dogwood tree and go and look at them, you will find those ribs very clearly pronounced in every one of the petals. Uh, it is important to put those in, even though they seem like maybe a less important detail, but putting them in gives you the anatomy of that particular flower. If it was a perfectly plain, smooth petal, such as it is in a, in a tulip, then you wouldn't get the ribs. But um, as long as we're dealing with life, with the wonderful opportunity to be able to observe these things closely, you will see that the more you look, the more you see. The center of this flower has got a little tuft, it's what I call a tuft, of um, very pale greenish yellow uh, stamens, uh, which in, um, for the most part are very pale yellow and, gr and pale green. So I've put a dark green on first to give you the shadow tone, and then I've given you a, a uh, sort of a pale green as a central tone, and then the highlights are done with just the very, very pale yellow green. Now the leaf that is um, speaking out from underneath it is half in shadow because of the light which is being thrown by the overhead lighting here in the studio. And that shadow is as important on that leaf as the rest of it. And the shape of the shadow determines the shape of the leaf. So we have, uh, I've, I have now put in that particular shadow. And here's coming the lit part of the leaf, uh, white, a little bit of sap green and some uh, yellow ochre, which has subdued the uh, greenness of the green that comes in tubes. Most of the time, the, uh, the, tubes, the tubes that um, have green in them are not the kind of greens that you ever want to use anywhere, actually. Um, I rely more on yellows and blues and blacks to make green. So uh, that, is a, that is a preference of mine, and it is something which I find works very well. You don't get those harsh and also unfortunate brilliant greens that come from buying a color which is called phthalo green. It is chemical and is produced with a chemical compound and it doesn't have any resemblance to um, living, uh, growing uh, colors at all. There is a little green leaf underneath there. The following one is almost totally in shadow. So that can just get put in in a very dark, in a darker tone. Well, let me darken that up with some purple and really make it shadowy looking because uh, that's what gives the depth to things, the shadows that are cast, even on something as ordinary as a small leaf. Uh, here's another one that is very much in shadow because of this petal right here, and it's got a, its, little, uh, its little curved shadow giving you the explanation of what that leaf shape is like. All right, so we've managed to go from uh, a dogwood uh, flower to uh, the leaves, and now I think I'm going to tackle the uh, absolutely extraordinary flower which is known as the petunia. I'm going to use that same uh, quinacridine rose uh, mixed with some uh, geranium lake. The, 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 the names of the colors are really rather fun. Um, and I'm going to tell you that a petunia is complicated and really uh, has got to, uh, you have to think carefully before you decide to paint a petunia because it really has got just so many twists and turns and ruffles and frills in it. But uh, when, you when you finally understand the anatomy of this little flower, you will see that it's great, to, uh, great practice to uh, be able to decipher what it is that makes those petals what they are. So I've got, um, geranium lake and some of this uh, quinacridine <laughs> pink uh, beginning to try to form the uh, petunia. Each petal on a flower should be handled individually merely because uh, that's the way the anatomy works on a flower. You pick it apart and you make sense out of what you see. If you just put a whole blob of pink on something, the chances are it's not going to look like more, anything more than a blob of pink. Um, also, uh, the fact that this, this particular flower is a trumpet means that you're going to have to pay attention to that even though you're not seeing it in the trumpet position. 
Um, it's being seen head on, but it has its shadow. This shadow here is what tells you that it is fanning out into a trumpet form. Um, the uh, paleness of this flower is uh, shown on this side of the trumpet, which means that it's catching the light there, and then it will require a blend out to the darker tone, which is this one. So when you have the dark tone coming here and the light tone coming there, the illusion is, of course, that this flower is going in at this particular point. This little uh, area here, which is the uh, underneath part of this petal, uh, gives the opportunity of having a pale color coming with the overlapping petal there. All of this comes from observation and from uh, understanding what you see and trying to use some logic about why does that look like that and why is this turning around in this way. Flowers require a tremendous amount of observation, uh, as much as painting a human portrait. And almost, uh, I mean, uh, the landscape is a much more interpretive subject matter. Flowers are really very definite. They are what they are, and if you are a realist painter, such as I am, you want to make sure that that flower is instantly recognizable. And in order to do that, you have to be faithful to its structure. I am... Um, I'm working in oils. I'm sure that that uh, may, be, uh, may or may not be obvious, but as you can see, my palette is a palette of oils. Let me show it to you. It's a very large one. I'm not sure that everybody needs one this big. This one was given to me by a now departed uh, artist of some note, and I treasure it because it's a mahogany palette uh, that served him well over a period of 50 years of painting. And it's, uh, it's an heirloom which I treasure. However, uh, an ordinary, perfectly ordinary piece of masonite would do as well for a palette for people who are beginning and don't necessarily uh, see the need to have, to spend a great deal of money on expensive supplies. They are not necessary. I have many times um, used uh, items found at the beach, such as a, a piece of uh, wood or a shell or a large rock for a palette. So these are just little practical um, pieces of information that I think might be helpful. Now I'm going into this lovely trumpet uh, inside this flower, which is catching the light from the other side and gives it a, an iridescent sort of glowing look about it in the light part. And then it becomes a little darker as it comes toward me. So even the, even the well, the tunnel, I suppose, is probably as, as uh, good a term as any for this little opening in the flower has got its two tones and there is a slight blending of color here and also I notice that there is a maybe even a dark ridge against there which I'm not questioning if it's there I'm going to put it in um, there are ribs in this one but not like the dogwood it is a single rib down the center of each petal and to be handled with just the most um, free hand. Uh, do not try to draw this in as if you were drawing with a pencil. Just an indication that there is a separation in this petal is going to give this petunia its characteristic. And they come at very convenient intervals of five. One, two, three, four, five petals on a petunia. Let me see, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, yes. Uh, and the ribs continue down into the trumpet. This is um, just an, another, another uh, desire to show you how observation has got to um, come into play here almost all the time. Well, we have two. Uh, the rest of this painting, um, which I will come back to after the break, is merely going to be a repetition of what I have just done, only with the obs observation that the flowers may be in a different position. Uh, underneath here, the little dogwood is sticking its, uh, one of its little petals out and giving me its shape by the fact that it, there is a lip here and then it, it, it's a perfectly nice rounded saucer-like shape, but it also has, it's casting a shadow from the petunia. 
And as soon as I put that shadow in, you will see that there is a three-dimensional quality which will take place. You know that this little petal is underneath the petunia just by the fact that that shadow is being cast from above. Uh, all, of, all of which may seem less important, but in the long run, it's what makes the, uh, it's what makes realism painting. Um, I'm going to leave you for just an instant now and do come back to see the end of this uh, floral study. So don't go away. again with the flower picture and um, I just took a few moments to do a couple of things because it was a repetition of the other dogwood so there's no sense in subjecting you to the repetition that's the problem with flower painting one repeats a great deal but I'm now working here on the um, on the artist's tulip and I sort of saved uh, saved part of it for you to watch me as I do this because these are such an extraordinary bunch of flowers they they, they have uh, a really remarkable change of color I don't know if you know I, I call them artists tulips because that's what the seed catalog said but it's possible they have another name and they go from yellow to pink to green with almost no warning at all and they are absolutely wonderful to paint even though they are quite complicated but they're the top parts of their petals are this pale wonderful uh, yellow um, that I've gotten right out of the tube there's a wonderful color out it's this one it comes right out of the tube and it's very pale uh, it's called just pale yellow and with for flower painting is absolutely essential to to get it and back here peaky around is another part of that uh, of that artist's tulip petal and going to its pink it's uh, I anthropomorphize these things and give them sort of a life of their own and make them make you think that they're doing this uh, involuntarily but anyway here is the here is the way of trying to handle a very complex flower by reducing it to a simpler, uh, simpler understanding. It, uh, this flower, as well as all the others, requires uh, a great deal of observation on what it is that makes them uh, look the way they do. Um, so bearing this in mind and, 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 and showing you that this tulip is, is in the background here is acting just exactly as just a background motif. It, doesn't, uh, it isn't the main part of the composition, as are the leaves, backgrounds for the petunia and the dogwood flower blossoms themselves. However, the backgrounds are just important as the others because they are what uh, reduce the mystery. You couldn't possibly just leave that, uh, leave these flowers in the background alone. You have to explain uh, that this is a vase full of flowers with some blossoms that you cannot see in the background. The, um, that's why working from life is uh, the most important thing uh, that I think that I can possibly do with this uh, series of programs to show you how working from life not only teaches a great lesson but also is far easier. It simplifies tremendous amounts of problems. This is a shadow on this leaf being cast by the uh, petal of that dogwood up there and this this uh, leaf here is casting a shadow because it's from the, the, from the leaf above it. All little details which are vital in the business of painting florals. 
um, shadows being one of the more important uh, aspects of how you deal with these compositions. Now, coming down, um, uh, I think I'm going to leave this alone till till the closing, so that we don't have to dwell on. I want to get into this uh, the, into the trumpet part of this petunia because that could be confusing and very difficult to understand until maybe I point out to you uh, how you handle it. You have to draw it. And there's no question about the fact that you have to draw it, but after you've drawn it, you have to understand what happens with the colors uh, in this little, well, I keep using the term ruffle, which I think is what these um, uh, flowers have going for them, is just a wonderful, uh, like fabric ruffles. The inside of this plant, of this flower here, is um, now being seen in very intense shadow, and a great deal of the flower is nothing but a dark tone because it's because it's way down here underneath, and it's also the inside of the trumpet. So, giving this uh, the dark tone is a. Uh, uh, not only allowable, but absolutely essential, even though we know that a pale pink petunia can't possibly have these dark colors in it if it's in a different angle. However, what we're dealing with here is angles. And uh, to observe the angle of this flower is what's going to give it its, its, um, its three-dimensional quality. Here is, the, here is the dark part, and I notice that way back here, the light is being caught by that petal just a little bit in the background. Uh, the kind of thing that one couldn't possibly imagine if you weren't working from life, and the kind of thing which is vital to the understanding of what you're looking at. M many people who see my paintings say, they look so real, how do you do that? And the answer is, I look at it. Uh, I am working with the object at hand. Um, my ability to see may be only a little bit more acute than the average person because I've been practicing at it for so long. You see, that's what my book says, working from life. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me get more going with this trumpet here because uh, there's a very pale part back here where the light is really, uh, is really catching this protruding part of the petal. The other one, the other part here, is now in, in deep shadow, and it twists and turns around these petunias. A lot of people don't paint petunias because they are intimidated by them. However, petunias are very nice uh, creatures, and they don't mean to intimidate you. They only do it by default. Uh, I'm going to clean my brush now and show you the gradation to, for, to the pale color, which is the pale part of this trumpet. And oils being nice and cooperative because they do blend well together means that I can put the, the pale yellow next to the pink and then come and blend it in a very satisfactory way, such as just by m merging those two tones together. You see, oils and watercolors are vastly different. The oils um, give you time to work. The watercolors are an immediate problem. Uh, I'm going to subdue the color of that pale white by using a touch of purple and a touch of um, yellow ochre because underneath here, this trumpet is having a shadow cast by the uh, petal above it. That's going to tell you that it is sticking out. Now, because time is running by, I'm going to get this, oh, this leaf is dark on, on one side here and it goes off to a nice point. Uh, addition of some white, and I'm sure that uh, you have observed that I use white a great deal, which is the most often used color on any palette. And no matter what subject matter you are uh, dealing with, white is the, is the blob that should be the biggest. It is the basis of all pale tones, of course, so that's why uh, you squeeze out a generous area of white and all the others can be in much lesser quantities. This nice leaf sticking underneath here is very dark and gives an opportunity to give good contrast to the, um, to the uh, petunia trumpet just below it. There we are. Now, all of these things, the information that I have given you here is all right in front of me. Let me show you once again my book, which is called Working from Life at the Cable Easel. And it is available to you if you will 
write to me at box 1014 in Setauket. Box 1014, Setauket, New York, 11733, and that will uh, enable me to send you a copy of my small book. At $5 a copy, I think you'll get an awful lot of information out of it. And, in, you know, not everybody can remember every word that I speak on the program. So there it is in the book, essentially what I say here every time I appear on this program. Now, uh, in here is um, uh, the darkness of the leaves in the background. And also, they continue back here with another part of that um, artist's tulip, giving you uh, the contrasting background for this pale part of the petunia and part of this, uh, of this dogwood, and also giving you the rest of the flowers up above. I think that even though this is done in a great hurry, you probably have understood the importance are uh, working from a given setup. The vase uh, should be handled with a nice subtle touch. If it is all one color or appears to be all one color, then by all means make it all one color. But if it uh, does have gradations of color because of the way the light falls, pay attention to that too. The vase or the container for these um, floral uh, uh, setups are just as important as the flowers themselves. Um, there is uh, a great deal of um, work to be done in observation with uh, vases. And I see here that this leaf seems to have cast uh, a form on the rest of this vase and also the side of it is catching the lightness of the background. So I will put just a suggestion of the light side of this vase here and then the rest of it is pretty much a uniform color. The nice part about it is that this uh, rim here is catching the light and telling me that it's a very, very shiny vase and the highlights are what do that for you, for me. Uh, here is the uh, application of this uh, general tone of the, um, of the vase and there are those little highlights sh showing you just how shiny it is. Um, I wish that there was more time to be able to concentrate on the uh, painting of a vase because it is essential that it be handled with as much care as the rest of it. However, maybe we will just handle vases in one of my future programs uh, about still life painting. It is um, it's, uh, fascinating because you can do either heirloom uh, containers for your flower paintings or you can do perfectly ordinary ones like a teacup or a yogurt jar or just a little wine bottle. Um, if you choose the container with as much care as I like to, you find that the painting sometimes has a lot more interest than just the, uh, than just sort of a, an, an amorphous blob that's holding flowers. Um, I think you'll see that there is a certain shiny quality to this when you, when you observe the uh, vase at hand and you are able to uh, put the tones in accordingly. Well. For the short space of time, I hope that uh, I was able to bring you enough information that you wouldn't be too frightened to uh, attempt a floral picture of your own. Be sure that you work from life. Don't copy other people's pictures. You only copy mistakes. I'm sure of that. Thanks again for watching and tune in on the Cable Easel whenever you see it's announced. This is Pat Windrow. Bye-bye.